Well, our uh, scripture today is from 2 Thessalonians. We're reading 2 Thessalonians as we're getting into it now. Um, we're, we're just starting a new series in 2 Thessalonians. Most of you were here for our previous sermon series on 1 Thessalonians. And so you're somewhat familiar with the believers at Thessalonica, the church that was there. Many of the epistles in the New Testament are written to address problems that uh, have arisen in churches. But we saw from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians that the Thessalonian church was a model church. And uh, Paul was presenting them as a model and one that many other uh, places would want to imitate. We live in a day when we really, frankly, don't like good models. It's kind of a funny thing. I guess people have always been like that. But there's a lot of envy. And if someone is doing well, then we want to dig up a bunch of faults on them. We want to find stuff. There's got to be, let's find some wrong in this person. We, we glory in finding the, the wrong. I, I found that some of the modern commentators did that with the Thessalonians. Like when Paul said to them that um, he, he encouraged them to, to abound in love for one another. They said, well, here's one of the big problems the Thessalonians had. They didn't love each other. But it doesn't say that at all. It says you guys are doing great at loving each other, and we want to see you do even more. We want to see you keep on going. And uh, you know, there's this tendency to, to kind of shy away from models because we, we think that make, you know, it makes us look bad. And I guess it does. But does that really matter if we look bad? Um, you know, if we need to see things about ourselves, then we can come to our Savior. If we didn't have a Savior, then definitely we wouldn't want to look bad because we'd be trying to justify ourselves and prove ourselves in our own works, righteousness, and that sort of thing. But where we have Christ, then when we see stuff and we see somebody that's a shining example, we, we want to go and follow them. Paul said, you know, imitate me as, as I imitate the Lord, as I follow Christ. That's the kind of thing that, uh, that we want to see. So this, this church was, was really doing well, and we need to recognize that when that's happening, is because of the grace of God. And that's what Paul talks about here. There are some individuals and some churches that could be called blameless. You know, they're, they're doing well and in their walk with the Lord. And we need to not only face that, but rejoice when we see someone who is blameless. And, and to praise God that that's so. There are a couple of problems that Paul addresses um, in 2 Thessalonians, though. Uh, he did in 1 Thessalonians 2. Of course, we're not saying that anybody's perfect, but uh, it's not like that there were a lot of problems in, these, in, in the Thessalonian church, like there were at Galatia or Corinth, for example. Um, it's clear that Paul is mainly encouraging them about how it's very clear that they have been chosen in Christ because of the life that is, is in them, chosen for glory. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 15, we kind of have a hinge right in the middle of 2 Thessalonians. And in all that goes before, he speaks about them as those who are evidently chosen for glory and kind of fleshes out what that means. And what comes after that hinge passage, again, 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 15, he encourages them to live accordingly, to live as those who are evidently chosen by God, and going to receive glory. So I want to read the entire epistle to you to this morning. It's, it's not really that long. It's uh, about five minutes to read it, and uh, I think it will do us well as we're getting into it. So please give attention. This is the Word of God, and I want you to notice, too, how it all hinges around. Like you really have the core of the whole thing in those three verses in 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 15. And uh, so, so, so give attention. This is the word of God. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. 
which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you also suffer. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe, because our testimony among you is believed. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not believe the love of the truth, did not, sorry, did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by God, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which He called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or by epistle. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. 
Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. May God bless to us the reading of his holy and infallible word. Do you see how everything is tightly knit together in this epistle and how it really does hinge around 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 15? I mean, the first part of this letter is about how God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to obtain glory because God chose them. That's the first part, and he's assuring them, you are going to obtain glory, even though people are troubling you and saying that uh, Jesus, the day of the Lord has already come. And in the second part, it's about how you should respond to that. Verse 15, therefore, brethren, stand fast. Second Thess- Thessalonians 2.15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. And then he goes on to, to flesh that out in, in chapter 3 as you get into that. So there's these two points that we're going to look at this morning. God has chosen you, if you're his people, to obtain glory, the glory of Christ. And since God has chosen you, then you should live for him. It's pretty, pretty simple. So let's begin with the first. God has chosen you to obtain the glory of Christ. It is obvious that God has chosen you if you are living for Him in a world that hates you and in a world that hates Him. This was clearly the case with the Thessalonians. Paul had been watching them ever since the day that they first professed to believe the gospel. He and his fellow ministers, Silvanus and Timothy, had gone to Thessalonica and they had preached the gospel in the synagogue there. They had begun with God's covenant people who professed to be his people. They had declared the glorious gospel of Christ, that God had sent him into the world to redeem his people from their sins. That to do that, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, had taken flesh and had gone to the cross to be a sacrifice for the sins of his people that they might be forgiven. That God the Father had accepted that sacrifice and had raised him from the dead to show that all the people that he sacrificed for were accepted by his offering. And then he was exalted to God's right hand and declared to be Lord and Savior, where from whence he is to be preached among all the nations, declaring to them the redemption that is in Christ Jesus for whoever believes the gospel. And these ones that Paul addresses in this letter as being in God our Father, Right? That's what he refers to them as in, at the beginning. In God the Fa- our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, they had welcomed this glorious gospel. Some in that synagogue, of course, at Thessalonica, had rejected this glorious message with hostility. But there were many that had received it, even though that hostility was directed toward them. And it was very aggressive in this place. And so that's why in 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14, he says, God from the beginning. Okay, he's thinking about when we first came to you. It hadn't been that long before he wrote uh, 2 Thessalonians that that had occurred. But from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel. When Paul went there, they, God was calling them through the word for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. But you know, Paul is more certain now than ever before that they are going, ones who are chosen to obtain that glory. Why is he certain? Because they continue to live for Christ in a world that hates them. 
In chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, Paul says he has good reason to thank God, even that he ought to thank God, because their faith was growing exceedingly, and their love was abounding toward all. Paul knew that God was at work in them when he saw that going on in their lives. These were the very things that he told them in 1 Thessalonians that he was praying that God would do in their lives. That they would grow in faith and that they would grow in love. That they would abound in love. It was clear that God had chosen them and taken them to be his people because that's what was happening in their lives. First, that in the face of opposition, their faith was growing. That means that they were coming to trust the promises of God more and more. To be more and more confident and sure about all the things that God had said to them. To trust His love and His grace. To grasp what He had done to save them. And to be secure in that. So that instead of being focused on their little old selves, like, you know, we we're all focused on, oh, you know, what's going to happen to me and all the different problems that we face and things like that. They were focused on the glory and majesty of God because they believed what was said about the glory and majesty of God. They believed what was said about the outcome of our lives in Jesus Christ. And so all of the things that, that make people so anxious and so afraid and depressed and all these things, they, they were focused, they were lost in the glory of God through faith. They were focused on Him rather than themselves. They were enamored with God and His grace. And it says in verse 4 that they had patience of faith. The endurance of faith. He mentioned that back in the uh, first letter to them. Instead of being tempted to give up, they were so taken with God's glory that they were happy to suffer for Him. And they say, oh, we keep having this suffering. But like we read about in uh, Acts where, where the church was persecuted and they came and thanked God that they were worthy to, that they were counted worthy to be able to suffer for His name. This persecution, it was not, it was not slackening. It was going on over the years. And these people continued to grow and to increase in their faith. They didn't say, where's God in all this? But it was just the opposite. They saw God all the more as these things were going on. They, they saw His majesty and His glory in all of these things. That's why they weren't bitter about it. Or why they weren't afraid or anxious. And in the face of opposition, not only was their faith growing, but their love was also abounding, he says. Obviously, God is at work. Paul had told them in his first letter that their love for each other was a model for other churches, but that they needed to grow more and more. They needed to abound. You remember I talked about it, it was like a, a garden hose maybe, and, and now he wanted it to become like a fire hose, and then to become like a river and like a deluge. God wanted it to keep, or Paul wanted them to keep on growing. He had encouraged them to abound more and more in love for each other. And the way he describes their love here is, is quite wonderful because he says that every one of them was loving all the others among them. Everybody was loving everybody. He says, the love of every one of you ab all abounds toward each other. Now these were people from all different backgrounds. They were from different nationalities. Some were Romans, some were Greeks, some were Jews. The people that often didn't get along that well. Some were rich, some were poor. And yet, here they are, all of them, loving all the rest. It was a glorious work of God. The deep love of Christ was burning in the hearts of all of them so that that love was flowing out to each other. It could only be explained as a work of God's Spirit. We're talking about people doing things like endangering their lives for each other. When someone is in prison and you go to feed them, knowing that you'll be identified with them and might be the next one to be arrested. This sort of thing. Or, or selling land in order to provide for someone that was in need. Paul is full of thanksgiving because he says, God's at work in you. He's alive in you and it's so obvious and clear. All of this made it clear that they were worthy of God's kingdom. Not, not that anybody deserves to be in God's kingdom. That's not what he's talking about. But on the day of judgment, at the end of the world, it would be clear from their lives that they belong to God. People would look at the Thessalonians and say, I wonder if those people are Christians or not. 
Like, it's, it's obvious. It was, it, be, it was so clear. Because of their connection with Jesus Christ, they were hated and rejected in their community. But they keep on serving the Lord because they belong to him. They've been set apart from the world, and now they are in Christ Jesus. The world is no longer worthy of them. And they are worthy of the kingdom of God. Verse 5 talks about how it would be totally clear that God was in the right for accepting them as those that really had been reconciled to Him in Christ. Through Christ, we're brought from death and rebellion and sin to God. And then we're reconciled to Him. And we live with Him. And we no longer are His enemies who are turned against Him as we once, once were. They're, they would be counted worthy of His kingdom as a people that really were saved through Jesus Christ. We'll have to go into that more when we get to it in more detail. This is, this is an overview. But, but here, not everyone, of course, has been chosen for sanctification by the Spirit and for belief of the truth. And you see, in some people, it's not so clear, too. Even people that have been, it may not be so clear as it was with the Thessalonians. So let me ask you, is it obvious that you have been chosen for glory? Is your faith increasing in a world that hates Jesus Christ? Do you trust Him more and more as you go along? And do you come to appreciate Him and be sure of Him in a world that ridicules Him and those who believe in Him? Do you grow deeper in your love for Him so that you're more and more living for His glory instead of your own comfort and pleasure? So that it doesn't matter what happens to you, but you're here for Him? That you die to self and live for Him? And is your love abounding more and more? Are you actually giving yourself to the people in your home? To your spouse? To your siblings? To your siblings? Laying down your life for them? Are you reaching out to others? Do you pray with a true heart of love and concern that, that makes sacrifices of time? and property in order to bless others? Do you love your enemies and those who have wronged you and seek to be, be because of how Christ has loved you? If these things are true of you, then it's very clear that God has chosen you for sanctification through His Spirit and belief in the truth. Because sanctification through His Spirit and belief in the truth is happening in you. It's growing. It's, it's occurring. He is the only one who can change you to be like this in a world that hates Jesus and that hates all those who follow him and that oppresses you more and more as you follow him. If it's not so obvious as it was with the Thessalonians, get on your knees and plead with God that it would become obvious. Because this is important. People don't have a clue that you're a Christian. There's something wrong. Nothing else really matters than to be identified with our God and to obtain glory with Him, glory with Christ. Let me tell you what it means for you to obtain glory with Jesus Christ. It means that you're going to share in His inheritance of glory. Just think of it. He is the Father's beloved Son. And now, having taken human flesh, He is going to have a place in human flesh that's suitable to God's Son in glory in human flesh. If you have been chosen to share His glory, that means that you're going to share in His inheritance. New heavens, new earth. Place for people that have a, a spirit and a soul. Spirit, I mean, a spirit and a body. You're going to live with Him in the Father's house and to live under His gracious rule forever. You're going to actually have a place in His kingdom as one eternally loved by the Father in Jesus Christ. That's the first thing it means. Obtaining, with glory, obtaining glory with Christ also means that you will be avenged of your enemies. Paul explains that when God takes vengeance on those who are attacking his people, it will be clear that he has done the right thing. You can see that in verse 6 through 8. This is chapter 1. It says, Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us. See, that's the coming into the inheritance in the end, to give, be given rest with us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those. There's the vengeance. On those who do not know God. 
and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It will be clear. These are people that hate God. And that it is right for God to judge them. They hate him. They hate his people. That's what's in them. In Thessalonica, God was doing something in preparation for the day of judgment that he does in various places in various times. He was letting the righteous and the wicked grow up side by side. Okay, it's like a Cain and Abel thing. One has faith, the other doesn't. They grow up side by side and begin to bear fruit. Each tree was allowed to grow and develop and to bring forth fruit according to its nature in a very, in a very vivid and clear way in both cases. Okay? So God does this in certain places at certain times so that we can see what those in Christ grow into, what is the potential, and what happens is they go on and on in Christ, and we can see what those outside of Christ grow into. What do they become? What do they develop if they are not restrained? We talked about uh, when we studied Genesis recently that uh, that's what God did before the flood. He let wickedness just kind of go wild. He didn't, they, didn't, they, they lived long lives and they were prosperous and the wickedness just kept multiplying. And see, it's restrained. God restrains it typically in the world, but sometimes he lets it grow up more. And when he does that, then when the judgment day comes, these people are models of what everyone else knows is in their heart. And what they, it, on the day of judgment they will. They don't necessarily acknowledge that now. But what they would become, what they would become in the day of judgment then, when he judges the sheep and the goats, then we see this is what the sheep are. This is what they become through faith in Christ and life in him. This is what the goats are. This is what they become as they grow up and mature. So some of them that have been restrained more, they still belong to those people that as they grow and mature in what they are, they become what these ones that are displayed here are. It's very relevant for us because in our society right now, we're in a time when God is letting wickedness grow more than he does sometimes in history. He's taken a lot of the restraint off, and we're seeing it develop. I mentioned this last week in our psalm that we were introducing Second Thessalonians with. Things that were unacceptable 50 years ago are now promoted. You know, sodomy, blasphemy, abortion. It's very likely that it won't be long until we're seeing the acceptance of consensual sex between adults and children. Why would we not see that? Oh, oh, no. Yeah, of course we will, if it goes on as it is. And we're seeing more and more hostility growing and developing against Christians in our society. You see, the evil is being allowed to grow up. Now, I'm afraid I can't say that where we live, that we're seeing the church flourishing side by side of that, because in a way what's happening to us, we're in a place where the church has once flourished, and we're really in a time of confusion and, and a time of, of disorder and, and judgment as God is chastening us as a people here. But yet, as his people, we, we still should, should look to bear fruit for him and to grow and to be a people that are, are true to him by his grace, and he will meet us as we come to him. But we're seeing more and more this, this growing up. This is, a, this is very instructive for everyone because we see where belief and unbelief end up. It's very encouraging to see the potential for us in Christ to increase in faith and to abound in love like the Thessalonians did. We, we got so much more we can grow in. And it's very disturbing to see what unbelief develops into if allowed. The very idea that someone... See, see here's the problem with unbelief. The very idea that someone should not only reject God, okay, which we all do, but also reject his call to salvation when he has provided a savior like Jesus Christ is enough to warrant eternal punishment described in verse 9 and 10. Because this is someone that's antagonistic toward God. They can be sweet and kind in this world at this time because the evil has not developed. But if you're someone that does not want to be reconciled with God, that is a huge thing. 
We don't recognize what a huge thing it is. And so therefore, he says in verse 9, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. When He comes in that day to be glorified in His saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. So Paul encouraged the Thessalonians believers not to fret as they saw evil doers prospering who were persecuting them. God is going to deal with them in time. So continue to trust in God and be sure that he will bring you to glory. But there was something in Thessalonica that might that, that made them to doubt, that caused them to doubt if maybe or be unsure is God really going to deal with these things? It's addressed in the first 11 verses of chapter 2. He essentially says to them, don't for a moment suppose that the day of God's judgment has already come. Now you can see if, if God has said, I'm going to bring you to glory, and I'm going to bring judgment and, and bring, deliver the enemies over to the, to, to the fire, and you would look and say, okay, it already happened? If this is glory, then I don't want to be part of it. This, that, you'd be right to say that. Paul kind of says the same thing about those that were denying the resurrection. Resurrection already happened. We're, we're to be pitied of all people because we're living for God and this is it? This is, this is what the outcome is? So he's saying, don't, don't believe that. You know, somebody somewhere was troubling the Thessalonian church by teaching that the day of judgment had already come. It appears that they are even using Paul's name and saying that he said it and maybe writing letters that were, were allegedly by him. So Paul, that's probably why at the end of the letter he says, I wrote with my own hand here so that you would know this is from me. He, he speaks of this at the beginning though of, of chapter 2. He says, now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to, soon, not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. From the way Paul has just been describing the coming day of judgment in chapter 1, it's quite obvious that it had not yet come. <laughs> okay, after they had heard that in the first part of the letter, okay, yeah, the, the day of the Lord definitely hasn't come yet. <laughs> they, that would be the obvious conclusion. The Thessalonians still had people persecuting them, and they had not yet been given that promised rest, nor the glory that they had been promised. They had not been avenged of their enemies. Their enemies had not been punished with everlasting destruction. So the very thought that this had already happened was absurd in light of what Paul had said here. So now you might wonder at first, what relevance does this have to us? Almost all Christians know that the day of judgment has not come yet. Almost all. There's some that say that it has, actually. But most don't say that. But think about the problem that we do find throughout the church and in our society in general today about these things. There are a lot of professing Christians who basically think that most of God's judgment happens in this life. You know, we go through enough hell here and uh, then once you die, then, you know, it's all over. Like, somebody dies, they're wicked, rebellious against God, but hey, now it's all, they're, they're at peace now. You know, it's, it's all over. They, they, their suffering is all over now. No, 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 it's just the opposite. They don't see the radical rejection of God that calls for the kind of punishment that is being spoken about here. That's where the problem is. We don't see the, the horror of all of us, all of us as a human race, have rejected God as our God. That's the great sin in the garden. That's the sin that Jesus came and died for, that's at the core of us. All the other sins that we committed to. But he restores us and brings us back to the Father, having to become a curse for us to those that trust in him. So we have pretty much the same error that... Judgment's already happened. It's kind of a different form. But it's a lot of people in the church, they, they don't really believe in hell. They don't understand this. So Paul goes on to explain in the first 11 verses of chapter 2 that God's plan is actually to let wickedness grow to even greater heights in the world over the years. He describes one who is called the man of sin 
who is going to arise to lead a rebellion against God that will look like service to God. In other words, the guy will be presenting himself as God or someone to follow. He calls this man, it is a man, so it's not a demon or an angel or something. He calls this man, starting at the end of verse 3, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So he's going to be someone who puts himself in the place of Christ, as if he himself is God who saves. This rebellion was already at work in the Jews who were looking for righteousness by works rather than through faith in Christ. But it's going to grow up in one who, unlike the Jews, actually made himself to be an alternative way of salvation, a way without Christ. I will have more to say about that when we get to it. But Paul's point that God is going to take away that which is restraining this antichrist, and he's going to let him emerge. He's saying, you know, there's still a restraint here. This is going to happen. This is going to grow up. And lots of people who hate Christ are going to follow him. As verse 10 says, those who did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved, they're going to follow this deceiver and say, oh yes, we have salvation. And and then when the evil is mature, God is going to come and judge him and those who follow him. The message for the Thessalonians and all believers is that we should not be troubled when we see evil and deception grow and when we see many people turning to that deception, when it grows to great height. God is going to judge in the end. The day of judgment is still going to come. The presence of much unrestrained evil does not mean that he is not going to judge. It's just the opposite. The presence of unrestrained evil in the world means all the more that there's a day of judgment coming, that everything is not taken care of now, and that that judgment is going to be very severe. And now you can see even more then why Paul is so thankful when he sees that God is alive in the Thessalonians, that he is at work in them, that he has brought life through Jesus Christ into them as a people. God, and that God was keeping them in the midst of rising hostility. God is able to keep his people. And he sees that in a remarkable way at this little place I mean, it was, a, it was a city, but at Thessalonica, a little, as far as the world is concerned, a little place, here God is preserving his people when all this is coming against them, knowing, looking into the future, that as this evil grows up in the world, God's people are going to continue in him. God is able to keep them and preserve them. Paul knew that God's plan was not to stop the evil in the world, but to let it grow while beautifully keeping his people faithful in Jesus Christ. That's what he was doing, and that's what he's doing for all of you. If you're in Jesus Christ, as the world opposes you, God is at work in you to keep you. And now the exhortation to you and to the Thessalonians here is to go on for the Lord. Chapter 2, verse 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you are taught, whether by word or our epistle. That's what chapter 3 is about. Since God has chosen you for glory, live for him. Paul points, for three, points to three ways to pour our lives out for Christ. Pour out our lives for Christ. First, that we should be devoted to the apostles of Christ. Pray that the ministry of the apostles of the word would prosper. Okay? First, that it would reach the elect with its transforming power. And second, that it would not be hindered by those that oppose it. You can see in 3.1, now of course the apostles were still alive at this time, you can see in 3.1 how he says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you. I want the word to do the same thing all over the world that it's doing in you Thessalonians. I want it to run swiftly. I want it to have its powerful saving effect. Even though the apostles were eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ who have now finished their work on earth, we're still to pray that the word of the apostles would go forth into all the world, that it would run swiftly, that it would accomplish its purposes. They're gone. They're at rest in Jesus Christ, but the word is being preached in all the world, the word of the apostles and not another word. And we want that word to go forth with power and bring forth fruit 
They have given us, the apostles have given us a perfect record of Christ in the scriptures. A testimony verified, given by the Holy Spirit with, that has power to save and to bring new life to sinners and to bring glory to God. How we should pray that the Word will work in us and in all over the world as missionaries and pastors proclaim it by the Holy Spirit. Just to think what, to what extent this prayer of Paul has been answered. And when he, was pray, when he prayed this, it was just getting started in the world. And now it's gone out. It's, it's, sweat, it, it's sped swiftly into all of the world. What power there is in the Word of God. What a horrible thing it was in the time of the Reformation when people that were translating the Bible into the language of the people were slaughtered by people in the name of the church. I mean, there were lots and lots of people that were imprisoned and slaughtered because they were translating the Bible in the language of the people. They did not want the word of God to go forth. There was an antagonism that was going on there, a hatred against the word of God. That bitterness, that hatred sometimes rises up to that height and we see it in the world. But we are to pray that the word of God would go forth. And that leads us to the second thing, that the word would not be hindered by those that oppose it. Because there's people that want to stop it. Paul, speaking of himself and others who are, mistreating the, who are ministering the word, says, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For not all have faith. There will always be those unreasonable persons that are trying to stop the word of God. And we need to pray against them. It's starting to happen in our society. We're starting to see a, an opposition and a suppression. What hostility we see against the word. Not only from those outside the church, but even from some within the church. Things that they oppose. I mean, I, I've told you about the church I grew up in. There, there was a fellow that I knew that went to um, the minister of that church as, as I did. It was a big old liberal church. And he went to him to tell him about his conversion. And the minister said, oh, well, don't worry. He'll get over it soon. And he meant that. He thought it was an awful thing that this guy was believing this stuff. Because he didn't believe it. And you see, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about here, the opposition. And so we need to pray that, that the word will not be hindered in this way. Paul gives us yet another manifestation of devotion to the apostles of Christ. He says that not only do we... Do we pray that the word would go forth and not be hindered through them, but also that we would hold to the traditions that are taught by them? That's what he says in 2.15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. And in chapter 3, verse 4, Paul expresses confidence in them that they are going to do this. He says, we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things that we command you. Now, traditions, of course, are ways of doing things. I remember being very surprised to learn uh, that 2 Thessalonians 2.15 was one of the favorite verses of those in the Eastern Orthodox churches. <laughs> this was quite surprising to me because they hold to all sorts of traditions of men rather than to the, tr to the traditions of the apostles. But I soon found out that they have outlandish claims that those traditions that they hold, things like praying before images of the saints and stuff like that, that those are from the apostles. They go back. And it's, it is true that some of their practices go way back, like having the Lord's Supper, that, that goes all the way back. Baptizing people, that goes all the way back. Uh, but to claim that such thing, these other things like praying to saints, that this goes back to the apostles is absurd. The worship that the apostles instituted is revealed to us in the New Testament. It was very simple. It was very straightforward. And there was nothing of this praying to saints and such things. These things came up. Some of them came fairly early in the church, but they were a century or five centuries later, some of the things that they practiced. And they were not the traditions that the apostles gave. They were the traditions of men, just like it was in Israel. What happened as soon as they came out of Egypt? 
They wanted to worship God like the Egyptians did. Let's make a throne for God, a golden calf. They have thrones for their gods. We won't put an image of God on the throne. We'll just have the calf. We'll just have the throne, and we'll worship God that way. The The Lord God, they said, Yahweh, that brought us out of Egypt. And right away, you see, it didn't even take a generation. And they were already pulling away as God, even at that time, was giving them the traditions that they were to keep in the Old Testament. Our goal, then, should be that of the Reformers, to peel away all the things that are traditions of men and follow the traditions of the Apostle, that the Word of God should be central. The most faithful of the Reformers peeled away things like the observance of holy days, the worship of saints, extra washings, and other ceremonies that had been added and cluttered the worship of God. Our goal should be to to follow the simple pattern given us and recorded in the New Testament. To add to that is to establish worship according to human will, which the apostles warned against. Our goal is to follow the tradition that we have in the Bible. This is what Paul is calling for here. And he also admonishes them to pursue their everyday calling. From the creation of the world, God appointed work for man to do. Before the fall, Adam was, even before the fall, Adam was instructed to tend the garden. And we see him doing that and doing things like classifying the animals. Work is a glorious thing that God has given us to do. When we fell, God cursed our work, making it toilsome. But it was still something that he called us to do. Still something we should do. But some among the Thessalonians were not working at all. Paul confronted them about that in 1 Thessalonians, and now he confronts them even more strongly in 2 Thessalonians. So this is one of the problems that was among them. 2 Thessalonians 3.10, he says, For even when we were with you, so it goes all the way back to when they were there, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. And you remember I told you in 1 Thessalonians that from what we know of the Greco-Roman culture at this time, those who are not working were probably clients of wealthy persons that supported them, patrons uh, who supported them. It was a way that things were done in the Greco-Roman world. If uh, it was a way of life, the wealthy members of the society would adopt clients that they would support financially. This would show off their wealth and give them prestige and influence in the world. If they were traveling, then they would get their clients to go with them, and they would try to get, of course, the best, most honorable people that they could get as clients. And uh, then they would they would they would vote the way they voted. They would do this. They they would give them power and clout in the world. One of the downsides of this is that these patrons did not take poor people and needy people because they wanted people that would look important. So it wasn't a way of giving to people that had need. It was a way of taking people that should be serving in society and making them sort of a a group of of yes men or a showpiece for these people. It's really not a lot unlike what we see today sometimes when a CEO will promote persons who are really not very skilled in their work uh, so that they can be part of his board. And they're not really given very much to do, but they're just to to be head nodders and and go about and affirm whatever he's doing and make him look important wherever he goes. Remember Absalom, he got 50 men to run before him. I'm the king, I've got 50 men running before me. You see how important I am? Absalom's coming to town. There's Absalom, 50 men coming. He's important. See, that, that's, the, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. It gave them, gave them clout. And uh, another, another way that laziness is seen in our society, not directly connected perhaps, but is through those who use EI deliberately as a part of their living. Unemployment insurance. Um, work, working and then ceasing as long as the benefits hold out. That's a selfish abuse of the system. You know, it's there for those who lose their job, not for those who want to be paid even though they don't do any work. There are a lot of ways to exploit the system, and you're depriving other people of wealth when you do that. It has to come from somebody, and Christians should never do that. We're here to give to others, to love them, to serve them, not to oppress and to exploit. Paul knows that it's not good 
for us to avoid work. We are to provide service, real service, for others. It's not that you necessarily have to do money-making things. If, if, you're, uh, if you happen to be wealthy or if you are living with people that can provide for you, uh, just that you need to be serving others. A woman laboring in the home is doing a tremendous service to others in her household and often in the community and the church, sometimes for no recompense at all in, in financial ways. Dorcas was a wealthy widow in the New Testament who used her time and energy to make clothes for the poor. The point is we should serve and we should provide for others. If we're not working, we should not eat unless it's the case where we're unable to work. In the last section, Paul also encourages the church to note those who refuse to obey his instructions and to admonish them. In verse 14, he says that you should not hang out with them as if everything's okay, but you should rather admonish them. Now, we're going to have to spend some time talking about that in the future, but the time that you spend with them when somebody's not following the way of the word is that you should be there admonishing them, not just acting like everything's okay, just sort of socializing and hanging out. This reminds us that we're responsible for each other in the church. It's not right for us to just let things go. We saw that in 1 Thessalonians 2. It may even come to the point that elders will have to suspend someone from the Lord's Supper or even to put them out of the church completely if they don't repent. But long before that is done, he says, admonish them as a brother. Treat them as a brother that you're trying to help. Try to win them back to the ways of the Lord. God is the one then who has sanctified us by the Spirit and by belief of the truth. Thanks is due to him for growing faith and growing love in the church. It's a sure sign that He is going to bring you to glory if those things are happening in you, and that He's going to avenge you of your enemies on the day of judgment. But until He does, it is for us to follow the directives of the apostles in Scripture. We are here for God's glory, and until Christ comes, then we are to live for Him patiently. Please stand and let's call on him and ask him to help us do that. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your gracious work among your people. You've you've gone all over the world with your glorious gospel of Christ and you've gathered people to yourself. You've set them apart by your Holy Spirit, changing their hearts establishing them in Christ, in faith in Him, in belief in the truth. And we thank You, Lord, that when we are established in Christ, that our lives are different because now we're reconciled to You. Now we are Your people. And we're able to grow in our faith and to grow and abound in love toward one another. And Father, we pray that it would be clear and evident that we belong to You, that it wouldn't be a questionable thing that people would wonder if we do or not. Father, we pray that by the working of your grace in us, that you would be pleased, Lord, to bring forth fruitfulness, that you would pour that water out that we read about in uh, Isaiah 35, the streams in the desert, Lord, that, that the desert might begin to blossom and bring forth life. Father, how we desire to be seen in Christ. Father, how we desire to be those who are known as His people who love Him in the world. We pray, Lord, that the glorious gospel would continue to go forth and to flourish and that You would use Your people even here in this place. We pray, Lord, that as evil is growing up among us, that, Father, we would grow up in the grace of God. And we know, Lord, that in many ways that as the evil does grow, that that Your church will indeed grow in this place, in this land. And we pray, Father, we would be among, among those who truly are in Christ, that not like the, those in the parable of the sower that turn away because of the, the persecutions and afflictions or those that go after the snares and the, the temptations and pull of the world. But, Father, we would be those who bring forth much fruit like the Thessalonians did. Father, we yearn for this, and we know that it's only possible by your grace and we yearn for the glory that you've promised. Help us to keep that glory before our eyes, Lord, to know that the things that you have promised 
will be fulfilled, that we will inherit glory with Jesus Christ. And that though we see many troubling things in the world, that it's all the more evident that you're going to bring about that purpose that you have appointed. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for all that you are, all that you've done in your Son. It is in his name we pray. Amen.